Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video, we're going to talk about the pupillary light reflex and accommodation. Why is this important? Because when doctors, you guys ever watch a TV show, you see these guys running in, the doctors basically shining light into their eyes and looking to see what type of responses they have. That's important because that actually happens in real life. What doctors are really looking for is a certain type. You know, there's actually kind of a little uh, thing to help you guys remember. We'll talk about it throughout the course of this video, but I'm going to write it down now. It's called PERLA. Okay. And this is some of the things that the doctors are actually looking for whenever they're doing the pupillary light response with actually shining a light into someone's eye. So what they're looking for is they're looking to see that the pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light. So round, reactive, to light, and that they can perform accommodation. Okay, so these are the things that the people are looking for. These doctors are looking for the pupils to be equal, round, reactive to light, and able to go accommodation. We'll talk about what all these things mean. All right, so what we're going to try to do in this video is we're going to say, let's pretend I'm going to take a light and I'm going to shine it into someone's eye. And let's say that this case right here, you see how this right here, we're going to say this is the right eye. And we're going to say that this is the left eye. What I'm going to do is, is I'm gonna shine a light into the person's left eye and I wanna see how their pupils respond to that. So let's go ahead and do that. So let me pretend here for just a second that I'm shining some light onto this person's eye. Okay, so here's my, my light, all right, don't make fun of it. I'm shining light into this person's eye, okay? Now, how does this all happen? Well, if you guys have already seen our video on visual fields and their actual lesions, you guys will understand exactly how this whole pathway is working. So if you guys remember, we actually take, this is the left visual field, and this is the right visual field, right, of the right eye. I'm sorry, this is the right eye, this is the left eye. This right here is the left visual field of the left eye. This right here is the right visual field of the left eye. Left visual field of the right eye, right visual field of the right eye. If you remember, there were two different types of retina here. There was the nasal hemiretina, which is gonna be on this side, closest to the nasal, the nose right there. And then you're gonna have one closer to the temple side, and this is going to be the temporal hemiretina. Okay, so same thing over here. What would you have over here? Over here you're gonna have the nasal hemiretina, and over here you're going to have the temporal hemiretina. Okay? What do we say happened here? We said that light, from the right visual field of the right eye is going to hit the nasal hemiretina of the right eye, right? And then we said that the left visual field of the right eye is going to hit the temporal hemiretina. So what is this one here? Temporal hemiretina of the right eye. This one over here is the temporal hemiretina of the left eye. And this is the nasal hemiretina of left eye. So same thing here, it hits the temporal hemiretina, left visual field of the right eye. Then, same thing over here. Left visual field of the left eye is going to hit the nasal hemiretina of the left eye. And then the right visual field of the left eye is going to hit the temporal hemiretina of the left eye, right? That's all it is, that they're actually having these visual fields that we're able to process. Then what did we say? We said anything that is coming from the left visual field has to go to the right side of the brain. Anything from the right visual field has to go to the left side of the brain. Simple as that. Where is this coming from? Okay, this is coming from the left visual field, so it has to go to the right side of the brain. So since this is already on the right side, we're going to keep it that. So it's going to be ipsilateral, right? Same thing over here. Okay, this is going to be the right visual field the right visual field of the left eye. So if it's right, it has to go to the left. Well, since it's already on the left, let's keep this on the same side or ipsilateral. Then what did we say? Anything, again, from the left visual field has to go to the right eye. So what's gonna happen to this one? Well, this is on the left eye. So this is gonna have to go to the right brain. So over here, it's gonna cross at the optic chiasma and then come down in these your contralateral fibers, okay? Coming from the left eye, but picking up information from the what? Left visual field of the left eye. Same thing here, this is gonna be picking up 
processing information from the right visual field of the right eye, but anything from the right visual field has to go where? To the left side of the brain. So this is going to have to cross over here. And this will be the contralateral fibers. And if you guys remember, what did we say? We, we labeled this, right? We said that this structure here was called the, it was a specific nucleus. A specific nucleus, and we call that nucleus the lateral geniculate nucleus. And there's two of them, right? These are basically on the thalamus. If you guys remember, we said that here's your thalamus, which is in the part of the diencephalon. Here's the thalamus. There's a structure coming off of it called the lateral geniculate nucleus. We're just zooming in on it. So we're basically zooming in on that lateral geniculate nucleus. And it's layered. It has one, two, three, four, five, six. Same thing over here. One, two, three, four, five, six. We said ipsilateral fibers are going to go to two, three, and five. Ipsilateral fibers go to two, three, and five. So how, where is it going to go then? So these are the ipsilateral fibers, these blue fibers here. So they're going to go to two, three, and five. Contralateral fibers go to one, four, six. So this is going to go to one, four, six. Then we said out of that, the information from this can come out of the lateral geniculate nucleus, a good chunk of it, right? Can come out and it can go through what's called the superior retinal fibers of the Barham's loop, which is going through the parietal lobe. That's why it's the superior retinal fibers. So same thing over here. And again, this is coming through the parietal lobe to where the calcarine fissure is of the occipital lobe. Superior retinal fibers or the Barham's loop. And then there's also going to be the ones that are coming from the inferior portion, which is coming through the temporal lobe or Myers loops, which are again going to the occipital lobe or the striate cortex, where the visual processing is going to occur, where basically the sensation of whatever you see is turned into perception. It's made real. Now, that's what normally happens to make you consciously aware of what you're seeing. But here's the thing, we're not looking at that. We're trying to look at how are our pupils responding. So this is going to occur at the brainstem level. It's a reflex. We can become uh, made consciously aware that there's light shining into our eyes, but we want to know how the pupils are responding. So what happens here? Some of these fibers that are coming from the lateral geniculate nucleus, some of them come into a special level within the brainstem, specifically at the level of the midbrain. The level of the midbrain. Now. In the back of the midbrain, at this level, you're going to have a structure here which is called the superior colliculus. And again, what would this structure here be called? Superior colliculus. So you're at the level of the superior colliculus. There's a nucleus just anterior to that. Let's make this nucleus, let's make it this nice pink color here. So here's this nice little pink nucleus right here. And this nucleus is really special. It's called the pre tectal nucleus. Now obviously you have two of them, right? Pretectal nucleus. So again, you can say this is the right pretectal nucleus, this is the left pretectal nucleus. What happens is these fibers that are coming in here, that are coming from the 1, 4, and 6, and the ones that are coming from the 2, 3, and 5, son of a gun, they're going to come into the midbrain. And what happens is some of the fibers might go to the superior colliculus. Why would some of these fibers go to the superior colliculus? Because if you know, the superior colliculus actually controls your reflexive head and eye movements. Response to a visual stimulus. So if I see someone walking by, I'm going to move my head and my eyes with response to that. That's the function of the superior colliculus. So some of these fibers can actually go to the superior colliculus. But a good chunk of these fibers are actually going to what's called the pretectal nucleus. Some of them are going to the pretectal nucleus. Now here's what's really, really cool. You remember that this was actually, this little canal here was called the cerebral aqueduct. This is where the cerebral spinal fluid is, right? Above it is the third ventricle, below it is the fourth ventricle. And then on the sides of it, you had the somatomotor fibers of the third nerve nucleus, right? And then what do we say, just to be super, super particular if you want to be, what was the structure around the cerebral aqueduct? It was called the periaqueductal gray matter. And then what we're here on the sides, this is actually going to be the Ettinger-Westfall nucleus. I'm going to put EW. 
Edinger Westfall. Okay, and if you want nucleus, I'll put N. So Edinger Westfall nucleus. So same thing over here. I'm not going to show all the fibers coming in here through each lamina. I'm just going to say they're coming in here. And then some of these fibers can go to the superior colliculus. Okay, but most of the fibers are going to go where? Are going to come here to the pretectal nucleus, which is in the brainstem or the midbrain, right? And again, it's going to synapse onto the pretectal nucleus. Now, here's what's really, really cool, okay? Which eye did I shine the light in? Let's kind of follow that because I want to show you something really, really interesting. Okay, I shine the light on the left eye. Let's follow the, the light from the nasal hemiretina. If I follow this one, it's coming this way, okay? So it's crossing over to the other side. These are the contralateral fibers. It's coming this way. Oh, it's going into the lateral geniculate nucleus. Oh, some of these fibers are going to the superior colliculus. Some are going to the pretectal nucleus. Okay, cool. So I know that the fibers that are picking up information from the left visual field of the left eye are taking it to the right side of the brain to the pretectal nucleus. Okay. Then I know that from the temporal hemiretina, which is picking up information from the right visual field of the left eye, it's taking this information and taking it down the ipsilateral fibers, which are going into the actual brain stem and going where? Some of the fibers will go to the superior colliculus, and some of these fibers will go to the pretectal nucleus on the left side. Oh, wow, so this is interesting. So left pretectal nucleus is innervated, and right pretectal nucleus is innervated. But you know what else is even special? The pretectal nucleus is so intelligent that it can actually cross. So it can give fibers that can go to the Edinger-Westfall nucleus on the right side and the Edinger-Westfall nucleus on the left side. So that's a beautiful thing. So again, what would happen with this one here? It would give information to the Edinger-Westfall nucleus on the left side, and it would also give fibers over here to the Edinger-Westfall nucleus on the right side. The pretextual nucleus is so amazing that it can actually respond to that, right, and it can cross these fibers over. So it has bilateral control of the right Edinger-Westfall nucleus and left Edinger-Westfall nucleus. That's amazing. Now, from here, what will happen? Okay, so we shine the light into the eye. We stimulated, oh, we stimulated a special, special cell. You guys remember from the uh, physiology video that we actually did on the phototransduction cascade, there was different parts. There was actually one layer, two layer, three layers. We're not going to draw them all, but there was the photoreceptors, which were the rods and cones. Then there was the bipolar neurons, okay? And then there was the one right after that, which was the ganglion cells. These ganglion cells are very, very interesting little buggers. Remember we talked about pigments that were within the uh, rods and the cones, like rhodopsin and then phototopsins for the cones? Well, guess what? Ganglion cells have another type of pigment. It's called melanopsin. Melanopsin. And what happens is whenever we shine light into a person's eyes, we can activate these ganglion cells which are consisting of the melanopsin, that pigment. And if melanopsin is activated, it can actually send, it can actually trigger this cascade down these actual neurons, the actual axons of the ganglion cells, which basically makes up the optic nerve, okay? So really when I'm shining a light into the eye, which is the main one that's getting activated? the ganglion cells during the pupillary light reflex. And they send these action potentials down through ipsilateral and contralateral fibers, okay? Activate what? Pretectal nucleus. Pretectal nucleus can cross to both sides, so it has bilateral control. Activates the Edinger-Westfall nucleus. If the Edinger-Westfall nucleus is activated, he's a parasympathetic fiber. He's gonna move with the oculomotor nerve, right? And when he moves, you guys know a little bit here, he'll come to a ganglia, and again, both sides. So this is the right one. This one over here would be the left one. And again, what is that ganglia called, or that group of cell bodies located within the PNS? That ganglia is called a ciliary ganglion. Now what happens? So again, these actual postganglionic parasympathetic fibers that are coming out here, they're actually gonna be a component of something very important. You know they're actually a part of what's called the short ciliary nerves. Because you know with the short ciliary nerves there's going to be sympathetic fibers and fibers from the trigeminal nerve that moving with it. And what happens is it pierces through the sclera. 
and went through what's called the perichoroidal space. And it gives supply to the ciliaris muscle, and it gives supply to a specific muscle within the pupil that we'll talk about called the sphincter pupillae. So again, what happens here? It pierces through the sclera, moves through the perichoroidal space, and gives supply to the ciliaris muscle, and it gives supply to the sphincter pupillae. Now, how would that respond? What would be the person's response? Okay, let's look at the response to the ciliaris, how that's affected. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look and see how the ciliaris is affected. And then we're gonna look and see how the pupil is affected by this parasympathetic. And then we'll compare it with sympathetic, okay? So ciliaris first. So here we go. This was our short ciliary nerve. It's coming in here, piercing through, and it's gonna give supply to the ciliaris muscle right there, this big chunk of muscle. Now, here's what confuses some students here. Right here is the end of the ciliary muscle. When the ciliary muscle, so whenever these parasympathetic fibers come over here and innervate the ciliaris muscle, they're gonna act on what's called M3 receptors, muscarinic type three receptors, which is gonna increase the calcium levels inside of the ciliaris muscle. Now, when it does that, it's gonna stimulate the ciliaris muscle to contract. When it contracts, it's gonna pull, so down here at this fixed edge down here, right? Right down here, what's gonna happen is it's gonna pull that part upwards. So as it pulls this upwards, this part stays stable right here. This stays stable right here. This part moves, and it moves upwards. As it moves upwards, okay, like imagine here. Imagine this is the fixed point here, and imagine this is that point down here. When this muscle contracts, it pulls the thumb in towards the pointer finger. So as it pulls it, this muscle shortens. As it shortens, something really interesting happens. You see these little blue things that were connected to the lens here? They get really, really loose. What are these blue things here called? They're called your suspensory ligaments or your ciliary zonules. Now originally they were a little tight, but whenever the ciliaris muscle contracts, these become really relaxed. When they become relaxed, they don't pull on the lens as much. And now because of that, the lens starts bulging and becomes really very globular. If it becomes very globular, this plays a role in what's called near vision, okay? So, what is the response here with the ciliaris? First thing, ciliaris contracts, okay? Then, zonules relax. Lens bulges. And why is that important? talk about it in a little bit more detail, but it actually affects the light rays that are being refracted into the actual eye onto the retina. So when the light rays are coming in here, because it's now globular, it brings this actual lens closer to what's the actual object, okay? So it actually is going to, it decreases what's called the focal length, okay? But it helps with what's called the near point of vision, okay? So that's how it's affecting it. Now, for the pupil, which I love this one. Same thing here, the short ciliary nerve is gonna come up and it's gonna supply the pupil. But looking at it from this view doesn't do it justice. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking the iris and I'm looking at it from the anterior view. So you're getting an anterior view of the iris and right here is the pupil hole. So this is where the light is actually entering, okay? Now, the iris has muscles that are circular, wrapping around it. These muscles that are wrapping around and are very circular, they're a very specific type. They're called, it's called the sphincter pupillae. And what happens is these sphincter pupillae have what's called muscarinic receptors on them. They have muscarinic receptors on them, M3 receptors. What happens is the short ciliary nerves come in here and act on the muscarinic receptors, the type three receptors, and cause them to contract. When it contracts, it causes this actual muscle to squeeze like a sphincter. And as it starts squeezing like a sphincter, it makes the pupil hole smaller and smaller and smaller. So by squeezing it, imagine me trying to wring out like a rag. That's what it's doing to it, and it's making the pupil really, really small. 
So as this muscle starts trying to contract, it makes the pupil smaller, and that is called constriction of the pupil, okay? So for the pupil, what is it doing to the pupil? It's actually constricting pupil, okay, through the sphincter pupillae. Why is that important? Because let's imagine here's normal pupil hole, but then the parasympathetic comes into play and it makes this pupil even smaller. So that space there is now going to be even smaller. Look how much smaller it is. Holy crap, that's a small pupil, right? So now that the pupil hole is a lot smaller, look how much light can get in. Very little light. So because very little light rays can get in here, that is very, very important because again, what it does is it focuses the light on a specific point in the eye, which is called the fovea centralis. It's trying to focus the light onto the fovea centralis within the macula. Okay? The macula lutea. So again, pupil constricts to focus the light onto the retina. Okay, specifically the fovea centralis where the cones are. And again, when the lens bulges for the near point of vision. Now, let's see how the sympathetic affects this. Oh, but I didn't explain something here. The pupil's constricted. But what was really interesting? What was the most interesting part about this? I shined light into the left eye, but which nerves got activated? Both short ciliary nerves were activated. That means that both of my pupils constricted, but I only shined light into the left eye. Why did both my pupils constrict? Because of this cross connection, okay? Because of this cross connection here with the pretectal nucleus, that's why both of them are going to become activated and constrict the pupil. Also, because remember, the nasal hemiretiny fibers went on to the other side, and these ipsilateral temi, uh, temporal hemiretiny fibers went to the same side. So there's a lot of cross connection there. Now, whenever I shine light into the left eye and the left pupil constricts, this is called a direct response. If I shine light into the left eye and the right pupil constricts. That's called a consensual response. This is what you should be seeing normally when you do this type of test, this pupillary light reflex, okay? So normally when you shine the light into the left eye, you could even do it, you could shine it into their, their left eye here and block their face if you want. Make sure that they have a direct response, which is on the same side, and then make sure that you shine that eye into that left eye and they have a response onto the other side, the right eye, okay? That's the consensual response. All right, sweet deal. So we talked about direct response, consensual response, and how the parasympathetic is affecting this actual ciliaris in the pupil. Now I wanna take a brief look at how the sympathetic is affecting it. We'll look at this more in the autonomic nervous system, but if you guys remember, talked about it many times, we have a cross-section of spinal cord here. Cross-section of a spinal cord. On the outer parts here, you're going to have, let's do this bad boy here, and this, no, let's do it in this actual purple here. This purple's boss, all right? On the lateral gray horn, or the intermediate uh, lateral gray horn of the spinal cord, you have these preganglionic sympathetic fibers. So preganglionic sympathetic fibers here, the actual cell bodies of them, they're going to come out here, all right? When they come out here, they can actually go to a specific ganglia. Okay, where a group of cell bodies are located, right, within the PNS. That ganglia that they're going to go to is actually called a superior cervical ganglion. Now what happens is, from this, the postganglionic fibers are going to come out. When the postganglionic fibers come out, they're going to wrap around this artery here. Ooh, you guys are like probably like, whoa, what the heck is that artery? This artery is called the internal carotid artery. It's called the internal carotid artery. It's a branch off of the common carotid artery. Now, these postganglionic sympathetic fibers form like a nice little plexus. They actually kind of call it the carotid plexus right here. Okay, it's kind of like a sympathetic plexus coming off the carotid. Now, as it's coming upwards towards this region, it actually moves through the superorbital fissure with the trigeminal nerve, like the ophthalmic division. 
When it comes out, it actually becomes a part of that short ciliary nerve. So some of the fibers here can actually cross over and communicate with the short ciliary nerve and go in with the short ciliary nerves, which is the parasympathetic and the trigeminal nerve fibers, and supply the ciliaris and the pupil, right? The muscles of the pupil. It also can go just with the trigeminal nerve and pierce the sclera and again go and supply the pupil and the ciliaris muscle. This is a part of what's called the long ciliary nerves. So the sympathetic fibers can actually become a part of the uh, short ciliary nerves and it can become a part of the long ciliary nerves. If it's in the long ciliary nerves, it's only moving with trigeminal, which is a part of cranial nerve five, a branch of the cranial nerve five, right? We're not gonna talk about that now. And then if it's the short ciliary nerves, it'll be moving with the parasympathetic fibers, the trigeminal nerve branch, and the sympathetic branch. Okay? All right, sweet deal. So we did that. Now, how does the sympathetic affect the actual ciliaris and the pupil? Okay. So if you guys look from this view now, let's say that this is actually going to be the sympathetic fibers. They're piercing through the sclera and they're going to supply the ciliaris and they're going to supply the pupil. Okay? Now, what happens here? When it goes to the pupil, I'm sorry, to the ciliaris muscle, it's going to relax the ciliaris muscle. So it's going to relax the ciliaris muscle. Now, if the ciliaris muscle relaxes, this part over here goes back. So now this part over here that was actually really, really tense before, really, really tense because it was pulling from this edge. Because before we were pulling from this edge, we were pulling it this way. Now what's going to happen is it's going to start relaxing and it's going to start going back to its normal position. As it starts trying to go back to its normal position, what happens to these ciliary zonules now? Well, now they'll be pulled in that direction. As they're pulled in that direction, they start becoming very, very tight. And as they start becoming really, really tight, they start pulling on the lens. And when they start pulling on the lens, guess what it does to the lens? It makes the lens really flat. So now, if you flatten the lens, what is that good for? Holy crap, if I flatten the lens, that's going to take this lens farther away from that focal length or the object that I'm trying to look at. So now, because of that, it's going to affect the actual light rays that are actually going to be refracted onto the fovea. Okay. So it's going to be more for far vision or distance vision. On top of that, it's going to come over here and it's going to activate this actual muscles within the iris. But this is what's really, really weird. It'll activate these muscles within the iris. Let's come down here for a second to see exactly how these sympathetic fibers are arranged. I'm sorry, these muscle fibers are arranged. These muscle fibers over here for the iris are arranged in like radial like spokes. Okay, they're radiating outwards in like spokes within a tire wheel, right? What happens is, imagine them all being at this point right here. A lot of the fibers are connecting to this one point right there on the iris, right on the pupil hole. What happens is, when the sympathetic nervous system comes over here, when these actual sympathetic fibers, sympathetic nervous system fibers come over here and activate these actual radial muscles, or you wanna know what it's actually really called, the radial muscles? It's called the dilator pupillae. It's called the dilator pupillae. When it activates these muscles, these muscles pull from that point there outwards. They pull from that central point there outwards. And they're trying to yank the pupil hole wide, right? So imagine I'm trying to take out like a, a structure right here and I'm trying to pull it apart. That's what these muscles are doing. They're trying to pull the pupil hole out wide. If they try to do that, what's that for? That's for dilation of the pupils. Okay, so how is this sympathetic affecting here? How are these sympathetic nervous system fibers affecting? They're causing the ciliaris to relax, zonules tighten, then what? 
Not only that, but after the zonules tighten, what happens? The lens flattens. If it flattens, that's for distance vision, far distance vision. And then it's also going to act on the what? The pupils. And it's going to cause the pupils to dilate. Oh, real quick, what do you call it? Let me write up here on the top up here. If the pupils dilate or if the pupils constrict, they give it another name. They call the dilation, they call it midriasis, midriasis, and they call the constriction meiosis. Okay, so if the meiosis is constriction, the pupil dilation is midriasis. Okay? Now, why are, why are the pupils dilating? Why are the pupils dilating? That's another question. If the pupils dilate, I'm not going to go over there for a second. I'm going to imagine this. Imagine the pupils were like this, right? Like this. Very little light was coming in through this area. Very little light rays could come in. They were trying to focus it onto a central spot. Well, now, if it's a sympathetic situation, a fight or flight situation, you want to be able to see things from far away. You want your eyes to be keen, right? You want to be able to see as much as possible. So, like if you're running away from a dog, you want to see all the multiple possibilities of where you could run, okay? So because of that, we're going to make this pupil bigger so that more light rays can come into the eye and focus on different parts of the retina, right? So that's going to be the importance for distance vision. It's dilating the pupils, and again, ciliaries relax, zonules tighten, lens flattens, and that's going to be again for distance vision. All right, sweet deal. So we've talked about the sympathetic supply to the actual eye, and we talked about the parasympathetic supply, and we've talked about the pupillary light reflex. Obviously, in any situation in which this is damaged, the, the actual uh, parasympathetic fibers, the sympathetic fibers are damaged, it could definitely have some type of problem on the actual pupillary light responses and the ciliary light responses, specifically the accommodation. That's why whenever you're shining the light and you don't see the direct and consensual response, it could mean that maybe there is something wrong, but it might not mean that, okay? That's when you have to warrant more tests, all right? All right, sweet deal. So that covers that part. Now, let's talk about something else before we uh, continue to keep going forward. I want to talk about something that helps to keep our eyes lubricated constantly. Okay, so I wanted to throw this in, in here real quick. I want to talk real briefly about lacrimation or the production of tears. Okay, lacrimal fluid. This is important not only for crying, unfortunately, but also it's very important because it keeps the actual cornea nice and lubricated and picks up any waste product. So how does this all work? Okay, let's say here, and we're going to number it. We're going to go piece by piece here. Let's say first step. You see the structure right here? This is the lacrimal gland. So you have a bunch of lacrimal glands here, and they're located on the lateral side of the eye. So let's say that this is the nose. So let's say that this is the nose side. That's actually the nasal cavity right there. And let's say over here is the actual temporal side, or the zygomatic side, right? Now, on this side, the lateral side, these lacrimal glands are going to be situated. You know there's a nerve, it's called the seventh cranial nerve, or facial nerve, right? So cranial nerve, seven, innervates this, right, from the pterygopalatine ganglia. So from the pterygopalatine ganglia, you're actually going to have these fibers coming out. Anyway, it's going to come here and release certain chemicals that causes the production of lacrimal fluid. What's going to happen to that lacrimal fluid? The lacrimal fluid is going to come out onto the cornea here. And it's going to move across the cornea and other parts of the eye medially. Because you know over here, you're going to have a little thing here this little edge part here, this little V part there, that's actually called the lateral commissure. So it's called the lateral commissure. Over here, this would be the medial commissure. Don't get that confused, though, with the space between the superior palpebra and the inferior palpebra. That's called the palpebral fissure. So really, this space right here is called the palpebral fissure. So lateral commissure and medial commissure. And then again, palpebral fissure is the space. So now, lacrimal glands make fluid, so lacrimal fluid is produced. Then where does it go? Moves lateral to medial. Sweet! All right, now where does it go? From here, you know there's like a little, there's actually a little fleshy part here called the caruncle, the lacrimal caruncle right there. 
what happens is this lacrimal fluid goes up through a tiny little hole here on the sides, on the bottom part here and on the top part. So up on the top part and the bottom part, there's this tiny little holes, okay? These tiny little holes here are called the lacrimal puncta. So it moves through the lacrimal puncta. Then from the lacrimal puncta, the little hole, it goes into, through these canals, these tiny little canals, and then into this big old sac here. Okay, so again, where is it going? It's going from this palacmo puncta, which is the hole, through these little tiny canals, into this big old sac. And then we're going to the next destination. Okay, so from lacrimo puncta to the lacrimal canaliculi, which are little canals. Then lacrimal sac. Then from the lacrimal sac, it goes through this structure here. This is called the nasal lacrimal duct. And from this nasal lacrimal duct, it empties into the nasal cavity. But specifically, where in the nasal cavity? Okay. In the nasal cavity, if you're looking at an anterior view, so this would be the vomer here. So if I separate here, vomer from this part down, and then perpendicular plate from this part on the above, right? From the ethmoid bone. This part here is called the superior nasal conche middle nasal conche, and then this one right here is called the inferior nasal conche. In between them is the superior meatus, middle meatus, and inferior meatus, little grooves. This nasal lacrimal duct empties in through the inferior meatus of the nasal canal, okay, or the nasal cavity. So, lacrimal sac to what? Nasal lacrimal duct, and then from there, empties at level of inferior meatus of nasal cavity. All right, sweet stinking deal. Holy frick knuckles, we've done a lot so far. All right, let's hang in there, we're almost done. Okay, so we've done the pupillary light reflex with the sympathetic, parasympathetic, and we covered lacrimation. Last thing I wanted to throw in here, was I wanted to talk just a tiny little bit about light rays a little bit more. I wanted to go a little bit more onto that and talk about exactly how that light is being focused onto the retina. All right, so now let's go ahead. Just I think it'd be good to get a nice recap, okay, of whatever happened with the parasympathetic and the sympathetic on the eyeball, just so that you guys exactly know how it's all affected. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So again, we said that the we were gonna make this parasympathetic. That was actually blue over there. So let's write over here parasympathetic. And then below down here, let's say that this is for the sympathetic. And then we're going to talk about myopia and hyperopia. Okay, so right here is going to be sympathetic. All right. So now, if you guys remember, what did we say happened within the parasympathetic? First things first, we said that the ciliaris contracted. Okay. When the ciliaris contracted, it pulled upwards, which made the ciliary zonules really loose. So the zonules, or the suspensory ligaments, became loose. So they loosen up a little bit, right? Then when they loosen, what happened to the lens? They weren't pulling on the lens as much. So the lens became globular. It looks exactly the same. Let me fix that a little bit. Let me make it a little bit more globular here. All right, now that sucker's beefy. All right, so now we got a beefy old lens, right? So this lens is going to bulge. Now, when the lens bulges, right, we said that this was going to affect the light rays, okay? It's going to affect the light rays that are coming in here. Then what else do we say happens? So was, the lens bulging is actually going to do what? It's going to bring the lens closer, like, in, like the focal length. It's going to shrink the focal length and bring the image closer, bring the lens closer to the object that we're trying to focus on. Okay, so the lens bulging helps with our near point of vision. And then, we said that the pupils would constrict. Why? Okay, it's to prevent diverging rays from getting in. So to prevent diverging light rays from getting in, okay? And to focus the actual light on the 
fovea. So if we constrict the pupil, it'll help to allow for the light rays that are coming in here. No diverging light rays, pretty much all parallel to actually come in and focus on to a specific point in the retina. All right. Now, what about the sympathetic? The sympathetic, we said that the actual ciliaris relaxed. Then when the ciliaris relaxed, what happened to the zonules? The zonules tighten, right? Because remember, it went back down to this position. As it went back down to this position, what happened to the zonules? They become tight. As the zonules become tight, what happens to the lens? The lens flattens. As the lens flattens, look what happens. You decrease Okay, now as the lens flattens, now remember, the object was out here. You actually increase that distance, the focal length between the, the lens and that object, right? So now it's gonna be more for far vision or distance vision. So this is more for distance vision. Another thing is we said that the pupil, what happened to the pupil? The pupil dilates. If the pupil dilates, this sucker gets freaking big, then what's gonna happen? More light rays can come in and focus more of that light on different parts of the retina. So now the light rays that are coming in here, we have more light rays coming in. And if there's more light rays coming in, we can focus more of these light rays on a larger part of the retina. Right? We can focus on now a larger part of the retina. Okay, so this is more for your flight or fight, okay? Or you can see this dilation response. You know when else you'd see this dilation response? When you're actually uh, going from like a, a certain type of room, maybe when you're going from a, uh, a light room into a dark room. Because when you go from a light room into a dark room, your actual pupils will dilate. When you go from a, what? This was going from a light to a dark. This would be going from a dark to a light room. The pupils will constrict, all right? All right, sweet deal. Now let's do another thing, and let's talk about, last thing here, let's talk about two different types of uh, situations that can happen in people's eyes, happens to me, myopia. And let's talk about another one called hyperopia. There actually is another one called old person's eye or presbyopia, and it's just as you get older, the vision starts being affected, and if you notice, you ever notice oh, certain older people, I'm not trying to make fun of anyone, but they have to hold the book all the way out here because their near vision is affected? That's what can happen. You can actually develop presbyopia, which can affect the ciliary zonules and the, the lens can actually start accumulating a lot of crystalline proteins. So it can affect the refraction. Again, they have to hold images really, really far away so that they can see it clearly. All right, anyway, myopia. Myopia is basically when the old eyeball here is too long. It's too long, okay? And hyperopia is usually the eyeball is too short. So what happens is, for this person, if the eyeball is too long, imagine here, I have the light rays coming here, okay? Here's these light rays coming in through the pupil. As it comes in through the pupil, the lens is going to try to focus these light rays. It's gonna have like a focal point, right? And the part where they, a lot of these light rays cross and then they kinda, kinda come out like this, okay? This point right here, that focal point right there, that's where the image is formed. Now that's not good. You wanna know why? Because the retina's right here. The retina's right here and it's not formed on the retina, it's formed in front of the retina. When an image is formed in front of the retina, that's going to affect what type of vision? It's going to affect the far vision, distance vision. So people with myopia, they are nearsighted. In other words, they can see things nearby, but they can't see worth a darn things very far away. So this is nearsighted. Okay, so they can see near, can't, see far. Okay, so they have a hard time with distance vision. How would you change that? Okay, well the problem is that this is converging too early. We'll give them some type of glasses or uh, certain types of contacts, a lens that will diverge those light rays. Well, what do you give them? 
give them a concave lens. So give them some type of lens like this. If you give them a lens like this, when the light rays are coming in, it'll actually spread these light rays out. So as the light rays are coming in here, it can help to spread some of these light rays out a little bit. And if the light rays are spread out a little bit, that when they actually come in to the eye, they're not going to be focused on that point anymore. They're going to be focused a little bit farther away now. So now the light rays, as they're coming back here, because we diverged it with that concave lens, as we diverge it, now these light rays will actually form where? They'll form perfectly onto the retina. And let's just assume for this case here that the retina is going to be right here. Okay? It's not, but just assume. Okay? So again, that focal point right there that it hits, that focal point is going to be hitting the retina. How do we fix it? We gave them a concave lens. Because the concave lens is going to do what to the light rays? It's going to be a divergent lens, meaning it kind of spreads the light rays outward. As you spread the light rays outward, whenever it converges onto that focal point there, it's going to converge a little bit more farther back. With hyperopia, the eyeball is too short. So now look, as the light rays are coming in and they're being focused here onto this person's retina, it's being focused onto the retina farther back. So it's being focused a lot farther back here. And as it's being focused a lot farther back, it's getting formed. The image is starting to form behind the retina. So where's the retina here? The retina is going to be, in this case, we're just going to draw it like this in red. It's right here. The image, though, that focal point is forming right here, behind the retina. So because of that, how do we fix that? We got to give them a lens that will actually converge the light rays before they're coming in. How do you do that? You give them opposite of a concave lens, you give them a convex lens. If you give them a convex lens, what the convex lens will do is, is it'll have these light rays that are coming in, it will converge them. Okay, so it'll converge these light rays even more. As these light rays are more converged, they have more convergence, they'll actually form a little bit more anteriorly. Okay, so they'll form a little bit more anteriorly and they'll form perfectly on to that nice old retina. So their focal point will now be on the retina. Okay, and the purpose of the convex lens is it's going to be a converging lens. Converging lens. So it's going to bring the light rays in closer so that the image forms anterior to, I'm sorry, a little bit more anterior on the retina. Okay? Missioners, we covered so much information in this video. I really thank you guys for sticking in there with me and hanging in there. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys really did understand it and, and I hope you learned a lot. If you guys did like the video, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. As always, engineers, until next time.